And John, you're muted. Yep, thank you. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock where we get started. Um, I'm John Spragan with the fire, I'm the fire prevention education consultant with the state of Kansas Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, today we have Craig Shad and Willie Jordan, I assume. Um, is that correct? All right. And um, they're going to talk about hood suppression systems. And give me just one moment. I will hand it over to you, gentlemen. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now. Yes, miss. All right. Are you seeing the screen? No, we're not. We're still seeing Willie. Still seeing Willie. Share screen. Share. There we go. Now we got it. Boom. Come on. So are you seeing the full screen of kitchen fire suppression? Yes, we are. Okay, let's go. Um, my name is Craig, Craig Schrod. And I've been in, uh, let's see, I've been in fire protection for since the 90s. Engineering uh, degree in Kansas State. Is that my phone? Nope. And uh, engineering degree from Kansas State back in the, uh, back in the 90s. And... Uh, Masters in business after that. Hold on, I'm shutting my phone down. Okay. And uh, been uh, in the fire protection industry, gosh, for quite some time. I've been here at Keller for like 16 years. Uh, Willie has been in the fire protection industry since the early 90s as well, right? Out in the field, out in the field with uh, kitchen hood suppressions for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Took over uh, managing the hood and duct department about what, five, six years ago. Well, six years ago. And so, anyway, what we're going to talk about is kitchen hoods. So here's the agenda. All right, the impact of grease, and then we're going to talk about fire suppression systems, uh, the design, what happens when they discharge, testing, inspection, and maintenance, and you know what we see uh, outside of just what's in the code book. And then we'll touch a little bit on new technology that's coming down the way, and then just a bit on food trucks and some of the changes that's that's happened there. So that being said, is 96, NFPA 96 really covers commercial fire protection hoods. And 17A is what protects them hoods. And so we'll go just a little bit through some question and answer because I have a computer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and hey, we'll go I just want uh, to remind everybody, please mute your microphones so we can hear the pr presentation. Thank you. And so we'll go through a little bit of this, maybe through some, uh, a little more of a podcast thing, and I'll, I'll engage Willie here because he's really the smart guy. I'm going to do the play-by-play, -play and he'll do, the, he'll do all the technical the good stuff. All yeah, right. To get through it. <laughs> um, type one and type two hood. Man, I forget this every time. Which one's a type one? Type one is grease hood. Type two is like a steam or an oven. So type one is the type that we put suppression systems in, and type two is just a thinner quality, and it's right. just like for steam. It's steam, not grease laden. Right. Not grease laden over dishwashers. And so what we have is this is our little grease trap here. This is what our grease goes into. Mm -hmm. Right, that'll play into a, a picture here coming up. Uh, yeah. Right, uh, how often these things have to be cleaned? That depends on the usage, Greg. 
So what's in 96 says, it depends on the usage or the cooking volume, right? Solid fuel is coal, charcoal, wood, and wood. Mm -hmm. And that's because it needs to be cleaned monthly because they've actually have things that- The ambers, the-, the ambers can go through the air. Right, right. And then a high volume that's 24 hour cooking, uh, low volume is churches. Churches, schools, low volume. Uh, moderate volume is uh, restaurants. Most restaurants don't cook breakfast, they do lunch and dinner. And they, that would they, be uh, uh, a long steakhouse. They do lunch and dinner. Then he's a good breakfast, lunch and dinner, so they call it high volume. So mm -hmm. if you have a moderate, it's like semi-annual, but what happens if the grease in there is more than like mean, a steakhouse is a certain amount of grease, right? Mm -hmm. Peanut oil type restaurant is has a whole lot more, right? So that's a quarterly basis. That's a quarterly basis. And is that just a touchy-feely thing or is it like, look, man, your grease is... No, nah, it's in the cold. It needs to be done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what needs to be cleaned? What we're looking at here is, here's our exhaust hood, and it's going to go up through the duct work and out the exhaust hood, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, we're going to clean, clean behind the, the hood. The we're going to clean the hood, and this is what always gets clean because everybody can see it. That's right. And the issues start coming in behind the filter. Behind the filter. And then we need to clean the duct work, and we get access panels so you can get into the duct work. Right. And of course, there's the hood on the top. The so the question is, is that we always say, is if your hood cleaner came out to clean your hood and never got on the roof, what happened? It didn't clean the hood. It didn't clean the hood. It didn't clean the hood. Not the right way. Now, Willie sent me this picture yesterday. Wow. You added that, huh? I added that. This is a hood that the hood cleaner, we said, hey, man, can you come in here? And this guy needs to clean this. He's like, no, I'm not touching it. Yeah. This top picture here oh. is the ductwork. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And this is the filters. And you can start to see, okay, we cleaned it a little bit out here. Now we start to see what goes up into the ductwork. This is a picture from yesterday. That's a shame. Like, if you, like you just said, the hood cleaner refused to even clean the hood. You know, he won't take a liability though. He said, well, I'm not even gonna mess with it. He refused to do it. They and so, it. you know, the reality is, is we see grease, right? Mm -hmm. And why does grease make us cringe? Um, okay. Well, a fire suppression system is designed to handle a fire on top of a grill or a fryer or whatever. It can't handle all the extra fuel load of all the grease in this thing. That picture back here, right? If we was to get a grease fire going, it would fly up that hood so fast, it would just go right past the links. Right. Right? And so the suppression system is not designed to handle the extra fuel load. And when a suppression system goes off, it shuts down the gas, it shuts down the electric, it shuts down the fuel load, right? Mm -hmm. But we can't turn off the grease. You turn off the grease. It's going to keep burning. And it's going to add to that fire, and then bad things start happening. Okay, so more importantly, the grease is outside the coverage area. What we have here is we've got this grill, right? I've got a thingy in my way here. I need to move. Okay, we got this. We have this grill, and the link, the fusible link that's going to activate the system is directly above the surface area. Right. But if the grease is outside that coverage area, it's going to go around the links. That's true. Okay, so the grease is outside of the coverage area, and also grease, it clogs up the link line and clogs up the discharge nozzle so that the stuff can't get out, or, and we'll get into it in just a second, okay. right? And the, being the link line, that is. Okay. And so I say, Willie, I need some pictures for this presentation. It's been a, a little while ago, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, let me send a message out to the guys. Yeah, okay, yeah. within two minutes, here comes these pictures. Okay. These are real pictures. <laughs> the one on the left, five-gallon bucket full of grease. I mean, Willie, really, they, they dumped it. Right, they changed the grease in the fryer. But instead of taking it outside to a disposable a unit or container, they left it right there by the fryer. So the grease just sits there by the fryer. Yeah, we see it all the time. 
And this one on the right, you had explained this one. I pointed out the grease, the thing in the hood that collects the grease mm -hmm. before, right? Mm -hmm. That's is that's the grease that's running the excess grease behind the plenum dripping in the grease pan and the overflowing is dropping on the floor. Now you told me before it was that little grease thing is about enough to do a breakfast. Oh yeah. Or maybe do a dinner. Yeah. It's not gonna a lunch. Right. It needs to be cleaned out constantly. What's happening here is that thing never come out. It keeps falling on the wall. Now, this blue line is a gas line, so the appliance is moved away from the wall. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is just making me sick. All right? <laughs> but the stuff keeps falling down there. Now, now, really, what happens here is, is it's fun. Okay? It's fun to create a little fire when you're cooking, right? Oh, my gosh. Now, is that really kind of the biggest problem when it comes to hood systems? Not necessarily. I mean, because you have people right there. If something goes wrong, there's people right there. But you have extension cords that go behind these appliances, right? Mm -hmm. That get crusty. And then they, they coat them, right? Mm -hmm. There's a whole myriad of things that go on. I mean, not only that, in the middle of the night things, people leave the chicken. Hey, did you turn the chicken off? Um, yeah, I did. Well, no, you did right yes. and so then it burns down and you have things in the middle of the night this goes to that and it goes to the other thing and it's just that fuel load okay here's a picture yeah i mean i wasn't going to do this but i'm going to go ahead and show it uh windows media player this. okay all right what this is this is a little right Okay, here's a still shot of that. That is the grease from behind the grill actually on fire. This happened just a week ago. The owner had time to take the video, video before he pulled the pull station. Okay, and the reason why it didn't go off, he had to pull the pull station is because the grease is behind the grill. Mm -hmm. So he took a picture of it, sent it to us, and then pulled the pull station and says, hey, can you come out and fix my, fix my thing? You know, all of these are points of why the grease becomes issues when it's not around, the, you know, it's not the grease fire. The intention of the thing is to put out an oops when you're actually cooking. The intention of the system is to put out the fire on the piece of equipment. All that extra behind the hood, behind the filters, is not designed to do that. It's not designed to do that. So what is it designed to do? What is it? Here's the components of a kitchen system. What we have is red lines and black lines in here, right? Now, this is the pole station. And what happens, there's actually a mechanical yes. wire. There's a wire that goes up into the ottoman. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then we have this link line that's above each of these appliances. And they look like this down here. It's a scissors link with a cable under tension mm -hmm. and a fusible link here that is two pieces of metal that's soldered together that's designed to melt at a certain temperature. That's correct. So them two pieces of metal separate when it gets hot. The link line, which is a bicycle cable essentially, like mm -hmm. brakes on the bicycle on your 10 speed, mm -hmm. it is under tension and it releases. Mm -hmm. And once it releases, it does two things. It shuts our gas valve off, which is the fuel source, fuel source to <clears throat> the appliances. And then it goes along these nozzles here and starts shoving out chemical agent. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, right? These are called pre-engineered systems. And this is kind of important to understand how the systems go together. It's a pre-engineered system, which means if you have that, then you put this. This many appliances, this much agent, this big of system, nozzles, counts. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the pre engineered system is flow rates, is nozzle pressure, it's agent quantity, it's pipe size, it's limited number of everything that says if it's this big, then you need that. What does that mean? Okay, I have a fryer, and a fryer takes one nozzle, okay, but it has three flow points. And so Three times as much stuff is going to come out of that nozzle as maybe a different one. So, yeah, that's true. So, we have a char boil, and it's going to take two nozzles with two flows. So, it's two flow points. There's a, that amount of chemical coming out of each of them nozzles. 
and maybe we have a range that has one nozzle and one without a shelf. Okay, what does that mean? The amount of stuff coming out of a nozzle for that fryer, it's three flows worth, so there's going to be more stuff coming out of that nozzle. And then two charbroilers, two flow points yes. each. That's worth four, where it's it's three for the range. Okay, what do we have? We have three, six, six, four is 10. That's 11. That's 11 flow points. Now, you will notice that I ignored the plenum and the ductwork, but for this thing, it's 11 flow points. Okay. How big of a system? Well, if it's an Ansel, a three gallon tank will give you 12 flow, 12 flow points. points, right? So we can use one three gallon tank. Mm -hmm. Or if it's an Amorex, there's 11 points and they'll take a 3.75 gallon. Now, because this is pre-engineered, we added another appliance in there. It's going to take a couple more flow points, right? So now we're over our 12 limit. And so we add a gallon and a half tank. That's right. It's all legal, right? It's all legal. It's pre-engineered. Mm -hmm. so really if you have that, then you have that. I hope that makes sense. So we have our system. Now it discharges. What happens when it discharges? Well, there's three ways to make it discharge. There could be a manual, which would be the rule pool, the pole station, <laughs> automatic, which is a fusible link that melts, or people grab the fire extinguisher, the K-class fire extinguisher, put the fire out. What happens when you use the extinguisher instead of using the system? If you use the extinguisher, you're not cutting the fuel source. The fuel source is not cut. Well, the other thing is, is that you got pilot lights on there, right? You push out a fire, right? That pilot light's still going. Everybody's freaking out and they forget about the pilot light, right? And then somebody says, oh, I better redo the fire, the pilot light, right? By then, you get a, you get a free haircut, right? Because it goes whoosh, because there's a pile of gas there. The thing is, is that people should be told over and over again, pull the pull station. station. Because it cuts the power, it cuts the electric, it cuts the gas. Everything underneath the, the hood. hood should be shut down. No matter if it's protected or not, if it was under the hood, it needs to shut down. And we will cut, we will get to the agent, the gas, and the fans. And it also needs to notify the fire alarm system, right? Anytime you have a hood in a building and it has a fire alarm system, that hood shall report to the fire alarm. That's good. Okay. So the chemical, it's a 300, a UL 300. Not too long ago, we was, what was in the 90s? When was it? 90s. We, it went to UL 300 in probably about 1996. About 96. It went from a dry powder to a wet chemical. To a wet chemical. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we have wet chemical, we have bubbles on this. Now, you can't take a grease fire and hit it with a power washer, right? Because mm -hmm. grease goes flying everywhere. So when this discharges, even the fire extinguisher, it is a slower discharge, which puts a coat of bubble. It puts a bubble blanket over the grease, mm -hmm. which separates the fuel from the oxygen. And we call this spotification, mm -hmm. right? Everybody in this industry loves the word spotification. <laughs> hey, it's spotification. All right. So that's the chemical itself. Mm -hmm. It covers the appliance, mm -hmm. right? With a bubble blanket. And then we have our gas that shuts down. What we have here is, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this or what's going on. We're gonna move that, it's confusing me. We have, this is a mechanical gas valve. Mm -hmm. So when this thing discharges, you actually have to, it's spring loaded and you have to cock it back to reset it. Reset. And this is an electric, one right. electronic gas valve that will electrically close. Right. Is this the reset button on the top? It, it is not. The reset relay is a separate device. The reason for that, if they lose power at night or the lights blink, uh, storm, they'll lose power, they'll come back on. You cannot, that gas valve would not come back on until they go physically press the reset button, then go to the gas valve. So this is like a flow switch that you can have some water fluctuation and then not roll the trucks. Right. Right. It's the same thing with the gas valve. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that makes sense. And when the fan happens, okay, let's talk about the fan once. There's an exhaust fan. You have, you're cooking, you're going to take an exhaust fan out, right? If you have exhaust coming out of your kitchen, kitchens are hot. Your air conditioning is going to be 
right completely sucked out of your kitchen right mm -hmm. so we put makeup air on it so the makeup air comes out of the front of the fan and basically does a little thing like this and exhaust it right mm -hmm. so it's basically the air that you're going to use to exhaust the fumes keep it balanced keep it balanced mm -hmm. okay that makes sense mm -hmm. so when you have a fire, your system goes off, the exhaust fan, you want the smoke out of there, so you're going to suck the smoke out, right? That's true. But you're going to turn the makeup air off so that it does not feed the fire. Right. For sure, don't feed the fire. Mm -hmm. All right. You had me put these three things on here. Night mode, interlock controls, and exhaust fan heat monitor. They're kind of all the same thing, but a little bit different. Right. You said that there's a heat detector. Thermal probe. Behind the filters or in front of the filters. It came out about 2011, Craig. Uh, we call it night mode. And what it is, is if somebody leaves something on at night cooking, they will they'll leave. If the temperature rises up to 96 degrees, it's all spent automatic kick, up, kick on. So it. if the exhaust fan goes about 196, 96, well, 96 degrees. 96, that's not very hot. I know. It's not supposed to be on. <laughs> And immediately turn that fan on, it's all on to suck the smoke out of the building. Oh, it's something on Does it shut everything down? No, it just turns it off. The system didn't activate. It's getting the heat out of the building. So if it gets above 96, it's going to just kick that exhaust fan on. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's all spin on. It's not going to dump the system. No. And if it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter, the system going to dump dump. Now, one side note here mm -hmm. there's a lot of times that the system will trip during the day because people turn all of the appliances on and don't turn the exhaust fan on. Yeah, it's a lot in the winter time. That's the interlock controls, right? Right, right. They turn okay. to warm up the kitchen before they get to cooking and it don't take that much. Yeah, 360 degrees, the fan gotta be on. So they warm the kitchen up. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then forget to do the exhaust fan. Okay, well, that makes some sense. Right. So what happens when the thing does discharge? Um, oh, it's the same thing. Um, you had me put this in here. The lights, because they're kind of an issue. There's a there's a difference in philosophy amongst AHJs, That's true. fire marshals, about whether you turn the lights on. Some AHJs want you to turn off all, all, all electrical under the hood, including the lights. Boy, well, isn't that what the code says? Yes, but also it's some AHJs are fine leaving lights on if the light is in a vapor-proof enclosure. Because that's what the code says also. Right. <laughs> right. So as long as the lights are in a vapor-proof enclosure, you can leave the lights on. Yes. Personally, I'm in favor of leaving lights on so you can see what you're see doing. See what you're doing. You do it for fire. You want to see what's going on. But the thing is, is that you can also have people that say, hey, I need another circuit. And they pull the circuit off. And next thing you know, they're feeding the fire with the lighting circuit. Because there's plenty of knuckleheads. There's no shortage of knuckleheads. No. All right. Da -da 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 -da. But we also test it. Every six months when we come in there, we go do it. We have to trip the system, right? right. Yep. So let's get into what happens when we actually test this. Now, I put this slide in here because it says it's a 96. And it also says in 17A that the person testing the system shall be certified. And what does that mean? Well, they need to know what they're doing. They need to go past the test. They need to do the stuff, right? But if you are familiar with an Ansel system or a kid or whatever, mm -hmm. and you go to a different company and you start testing them systems, are you certified? And it's not the knowledge of the person out there performing the inspection. It has a lot more to do with the manufacturers, the recall notices, and all of the stuff that goes with being an authorized distributor for a certain company, right? Right. Your certification stays with that company. If you're a pro, you move from one company to another company, that doesn't qualify to be certified. Because you don't have all the knowledge. That's right. Not the knowledge of the system, but all the back knowledge mm -hmm. of the manufacturer's inside information. I mean, we're not certified for all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Maybe, okay. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway that's besides yeah. the point. All right. There are certain things I don't know, so I walk in. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, who is responsible for the inspection? Owner. The owner is responsible for it. So your alarm company does not show up for two months after your inspection is due. Well, shame on them, but ultimately it's the owner's responsibility. And that is the same thing in the code for the fire alarm code 
the sprinkler code, all of them, it's the same thing. The owners are responsible ultimately for them inspections. Mm. Mrs. Kenman, when we test a system, we need to activate it, mm -hmm. right? That's you true. take out the firing links in there that actually keeps it from discharging, but you need to make sure that the thing trips. It trips the gas valve, it turns the electricity off, it makes the exhaust fan change state. Mm -hmm. The little pin fires in there, and we do this by actually pulling the pull station mm -hmm. and going to the last link mm -hmm. in the line and cutting a link to this link. So that cable that's going through this conduit, right. and this conduit's open and exposed and grease gets up in there, right? Yeah. So you need to make sure that that thing freely slides over there mm -hmm. and not, you can't help it. You can't tug on it to make sure it goes through there. Right. Because in the reality, we showed you some of them pictures with the grease in there, that grease will grab at that link line and it will hold it. And we go through many of these things and people are like, no, I, I don't want the expense of cleaning out that line. You can't, I don't want you, I don't want to pay for you to replace this. It needs to be replaced. And that's when we start putting red tags on right. systems, right? Because it won't work. That's usually, if a system doesn't function, usually it's probably nine to 10 gonna be the link line. And like you said, Cleaning grease over time gets into the conduit in the fuse blink. If they do have a fire, it needs to melt, it needs to be flow. And it, sometimes it doesn't. And we change the link lines. We'll get into links, in, I think, in just a second. But we change the link lines and they're dated. And we have to note the dates on the inspection form. That's true. Make sure there's agent in it. Check the gauges. Not all systems have gauges because they're not all under pressure. They act, they, they operate in different ways. We check the conduit and the pipe to make sure that everything's cleared and that it activates the fire alarm panel. Okay. Why are the links changed in each inspection? Because the answer lose, is they lose their integrity, they heat up and cool down. Every day. Right. They get hot, they get cold. Right. They get dated. hot, they get cold. Yep. And they are dated. And typically we will, and it's generally accepted that we hang the link. The old links on the pull station of the audit. And the reason we do that is because it's a lot easier looking at the dates of the links hanging on the pull station than to climb your happy self up oh. into the hood. Not ASJ won't. Looking at links. Right. Yeah, right. Not ASJ won't to hang oh. the remote pool. Because when people don't require this, links don't get changed. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's amazing. Where does the pull station go? It needs to be 10 or 20 foot from the hood because it can't be too close to the hood because the hood's on fire and you're gonna go in there and go pull it, right? Path of egress towards a lighted exit and not behind a stack of boxes. Now, usually the pull station is there for the boxes. And the reason I put this slide in here is sometimes the question comes up, what am I asking somebody to do when I say you need to move your pull station? because it's always behind some boxes. Every time I come in here, you need to move it. It needs to be a conduit path from that pole station to the ottoman. Ottoman is where all the main controls are. Mm -hmm. And so if you're moving it over yay far, sometimes it's a big deal, sometimes it's not. But the reality is, is the boxes are there. When you're there, I can't imagine when you're not there. When you're not there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we fight that fight a lot. Mm -hmm. Say, look, man. They move them right, right there. They move them. You have to walk out the door. Probably put them right back until the next time. <clears throat> Why do we need nozzle caps? Okay. Little red nozzle caps on there. Why do we need them? Thanks. Well, because the grease creeps up into them nozzles. And it, 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 that's not a really big opening. No. For that nozzle of no, right? It's not at all. And it impedes the discharge pattern. And if you can look at this picture that it took off, uh, purchased off Shutterstock, right? The nozzle cap's about ready to fall off. Okay, it happens all the time. It gets hot in there. Now, you can replace them with. They got metal nozzle caps. Metal nozzle caps, mm -hmm. they just don't fall off. They don't fall off. They got the old rings in there. They look tighter, but that's the older style nozzle. The new ones. Now, this is a couple of dollars. Are cap as opposed to a $15 cap. Over That's there. true. Yeah. But if they're everywhere you go, every restaurant that you look out there, there's these little red things and they're all hanging down and 
right? We fight this over and over and over again. It's like just buy some metal caps and be done with it. Right. Because bad things happen. The reality is <clears throat> these caps are off, there's grease up in them, they're buying a new nozzle anyway, right? Uh, yeah. Because you just can't take the chance. Right, right. You're buy it and you let it get clogged up. Like I said, you'll be replacing the nozzle instead of just replacing the cap. Point is, when you see these systems out there, you can suggest them that they use the metal caps. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if you move a nozzle? And why would people move a nozzle? Uh, okay, when they're in there cleaning them, I'll take this. Okay. When they're, because we've got, we're at 26 to 42 and we're half an hour in. Okay. We have uh, hood cleaners, people when they're just playing clean in their kitchen, when they're doing it every night, these nozzles, they hang down in your way, right? Not only that, when they're wearing the fancy hats in there, they get, you hit them on the nozzle a couple of times and then you just plain boot the nozzle. It's a very bad thing. They have to be in a specific place. Dimensionally from and around each appliance. They cannot be moved. The only other problem I have with this thing is what? I had two guys with smiles on their face cleaning grease out of the kitchen. That never happened. <laughs> okay, the smiles things. Why don't we like holes in hoods? In this picture, you can see we're missing a filter. We don't like them because heat rises unless there's a better path. The links are above the middle of each appliance and the heat is designed to go straight up. If you have a hole, we have a gap. If it's a missing filter, it's ginormous. There's also smaller gaps in there. It redirects the path of the heat. That's true. That's a product, you know, that's protecting the appliance. Um, screw holes in the plenum. When you're installing these things, if you miss a stud when you're putting the hood in, right? The, the, the ductwork. You pull the screw out and you try it again, right? That's a little bitty hole. And over time, grease goes, spills out that little hole. Now you have a fire. When you have a fire and it goes up into the ductwork, it's hot. Grease burns hot it creates a tremendous amount of pressure. That little hole now turns into a little blowtorch with grease on the other side of it. The next thing you know, the rope's on fire. Sure. So I'm, uh, we're, we're practicing this thing. And Willie tells me, there is a technique that people actually take the light, mm -hmm. turn all the lights off in the kitchen, mm -hmm. the light shove test. the light down in there. And so you can see any holes that's gonna roll out. Yeah, there's some ASJ required that light test. So the question is, is who needs to be there at the final test? I mean, it's you. People take shortcuts going through this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We can go tell them certain things, but boy, it sure makes it a lot easier when I have the enforcer sitting right beside us. So what appliances do not need to be changed? I uh, do not need coverage, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Steamers, kettles, and convection ovens. They're non-grease laden appliances. Man, I know you explained this to me, but this oven is full of chickens. Rotisserie is a little different because it's a closed unit. I know it produces grease, but they're closed. If they have a fire, just leave the door closed. There's no way to protect the rotisserie that's closed because we can't drill a hose into the unit. I mean, that's- So you trip the system, Cuts the power to cuts the that power. oven. It will still cut the power to the And you leave it closed. You just need to do it closed. The grill is open, the fryer is open, a broiler is open. You know, you're protecting it, but something like that, you cannot drill a hole into the unit to protect it. Huh. So you need to protect the things under the hood. Mm -hmm. Do all appliances need to be under the hood? Yeah, if they're producing grease, they need to be under the hood. Not only under the hood, six inches from the edge. Mm -hmm. Does this one count? Mm -hmm. We have, okay. Well, the fact that there's a residential stove inside and under this hood is one thing, okay? Uh, this nozzle is gonna be protected in between the two items, right? Mm -hmm. So neither one of them is protected correctly. That's true. 
Mm -hmm. And it's not underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. What about this one? Okay, the edge of the hood is right here. It's not out here. The edge of the hood's right here. And once upon a time, we probably were six inches within. Yeah, Looks to me like we went to a garage sale and picked up a fryer. Yeah, or got a bigger grill. Like the, the grill's in between both appliances. Bigger grill. That would make some sense as well. It also looks like we used to take a grill that used to have a nozzle that went to its side, mm -hmm. got us some shiny new pipe, and put us a new nozzle in. At least they put a metal cap on it, right? Yeah. That's Point is, this doesn't work. Let's look inside the control panel, the ottoman of the control panel. You see this wiring in here? Mm -hmm. This is a mess. All right. This is one of our field. That's when we said. Yes, the guy sent this in as well. Okay, let's look at this one instead. It's the same thing, only a little bit different. What we have going on here, here's our micro switches. This is what shuts the electric down. This is where it <laughs> arms the fire alarm panel and whatnot. Right. This mechanism here is a mechanical mechanism. It's spring-loaded. So there's moving parts in here. If we have a mess going on like this, it can possibly mess up the mechanical actuation. Not only that, we have wire nuts in here. This is not a listed enclosure for electrical. You can't have wire nuts in here. Okay? It needs to have a box on the outside. So when you see this, it's not, it's not acceptable. Here we have another picture. This is a system. Okay, this is obviously, this is a blow up of what I tried to show as a blow up of this area right here. But first off, we used to have a three gallon tank. Okay, it probably used to have a smaller knot cartridge in it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we put a bigger cartridge in it because we now, this is the expelling uh, yes. gas, mm -hmm. it's the nitrogen to get the chemical out of this tank. Mm -hmm. Now, is it pretty? Not necessarily. Is it legal? Well, maybe because it's a it, it is a pre-engineered system. If we increase the size of the kitchen hood, we can increase the size of the agent, right? Mm -hmm. This is not a perfect world here because our manifold should be balanced. It's not balanced. Is that the end of the world? Maybe, maybe not. Is it designed to be that way? No. No. Could it work? Probably. Yeah, it could. Right concept, bad design. The issue that I have is we now just took a rubber hose. This yeah. gas needs to get this agent out of these tanks. Right. We now didn't get quite close enough and we started throwing rubber hoses on it. It's a pre-engineered system. It's designed to work on a certain way. Throwing rubber hoses in there. No. It's just not the way to do it. No, it's not a design. If there's any questions, take a picture, send it to us. They'll let you know, right? It's for the betterment of all of the industry. What's new in the industry? Um, all manufacturers have been trying to get to electronic detection for a long time. What that means is instead of using bicycle cable and scissors links that seize up, it's they're trying to go to a protection wire line, a protector wire line, which is basically two cables with a coating that's going to dissolve at whatever, 155, 280, 356, or 500. And that's got an outer coating that's also going to help squeeze the two wires together. So when it gets to a certain temperature, it's going to short out, activate the system. Activate the system. Why does the world bite it? Well, A, because it's different. You know how that goes, anything that's different. And B, it also now requires electronic programming. It's not just a mechanical system anymore. I would say within the next five years, it's going to get more. It's finally starting to take some traction. Jeez. Okay. And Ansel calls this the red system, restaurant electronic detection. Mm -hmm. Ansel has, uh, Amrex has one out. Strike. 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 They all have one out there. It's coming. The last thing I wanted to cover just a bit was food trucks and are they safe? And the reason I bring food trucks into this is because as of the end of this quarter this year, this you, 
It used to be that food trucks were grandfathered in that they did not have to have the carbon monoxide mm -hmm. and, propane leak. and propane leak detectors inside the truck. Mm -hmm. They now do. Mm -hmm. We are now also getting a look at these things and some of the things that should not be done and changed, right? And so we went through some presentations over this because kitchens are somewhat isolated, right? Mm -hmm. From the people eating. That's right. Within food trucks, the people are all just right there. And the more food trucks, the more people, the more people, the more food trucks, and right, it becomes big events. They're really kind of cool. Um, what can go wrong? It's a moving kitchen. Willie took this picture. Right. What like happened here is our tank fell off the bracket. So we didn't install it. We did not we install it. it. Customer because came by here for us to fix it. You typically will put these components closer to the ground because right. they do move. Here we install the bottle on the floor because, like you said, they do move traveling up, bouncing. And we did the control here, we leave it up high. Well, not only that, I just noticed that that cake glass is in the wrong spot in oh, here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there's rules of where that thing has right. to be. Sure. Okay, but let's go. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to. Let's go here. I'm going to copy this. Copy this. Uh oh. Uh -oh. I need to stop this because they cuss. You want to know? Oh, you want to know? On the range doesn't work for you. I'm a golfer. Cool truck. Okay. I need to stop that. It is a food truck. The problem with food trucks are what? Two things. You have generators doing the electrical part, mm -hmm. and that produces carbon monoxide. That's true. And that generator then needs to be Ten. 10 foot away from the truck. Right. Sometimes that becomes an issue. Now, the propane, can it be mounted on the back of the truck? Okay. But it needs to be outside, right? Yes. Not on the back, outside, with the propane leak detector. But it's just a propane tank. Yeah. It doesn't have a lot of safeguards of what? say natural gas when it comes into a building right? right and not only that it's a moving truck and things get loose and things fall and the issue is is the number of people that are that close to the truck itself not only mm -hmm. that if one truck goes man it looks like saturn missiles right. some of the other videos I, it gets a little intense and a lot of times they're at festivals, which means there's drunk people there and nothing can go bad. Somebody's drunk, right? right? And so a little awareness of food trucks, the importance of it, the code changes going through there. And the thing is, is that there has been this perception for a long time that, hey, it's just a food truck. You get a little more laps in, 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 in some of the code requirements of them. Mm -hmm. Food trucks are gaining a lot of attention because they're quite trivially gaining a lot of popularity because restaurants went down, they closed through the pandemic. It's a cheap way to get back up and going. And plus it's fun. A couple hundred thousand, you can be in a food truck operating, moving decibel to decibel. <clears throat> okay, look at that, 44 minutes. Did I do all right, John? Fantastic. Thank you for, for the information, gentlemen. If anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat, or if you're on mute and ask, that's fine, too. Um, we've got four in the chat, from what I can see. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, so someone was asking about the hood cleaning contractor to determine how often hood, uh, hood should be cleaned, and you showed that earlier. It's in the code. Um it depends on the the amount of cooking they're doing in the kitchen. I don't know if you can go back to that slide or just um, mention that. Maybe somebody joined late and didn't see that. I'm not sure. There it is. Um, hi, boy. 
volume, low volume solid fuel. I know a lot of the hood cleaners are say, look, unless this is on a quarterly basis, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And the reason is, is because it takes so long to clean them and it just gets nasty. Um, the other thing is, is a lot of restaurant owners say, Downtime. I only want to do it every six months and then they complain because it took too long or a little piece of grease got on the middle of the stove as well. Mm -hmm. Quarterly is when most of them should be done, quite truthfully. I don't know why it even reaches out to every six, six months. months. You know, if it's, uh, you know, some schools, man, the school lunches that I ate when I was a kid was in a smaller town up in Seneca, man, the lunches were awesome. I can't imagine them things needed to be cleaned annually. Now, there's other ones that are community centers that get used three times a year. Right. Churches. <clears throat> right. So is it up to the hood cleaner? A lot of times the hood cleaner will say, I'm not doing your hood anymore unless I can do this thing quarterly. Or they have some really nasty ones. It's going to be, we're doing a monthly. It's the only way that I'm going to do it. Got to report to compliance agent now, too. Because in all reality, as soon as there's a fire, here comes Willie and the hood cleaner. I mean, they're, who's getting sued, right? It's right? the first people on site. And they're like, look, I'm not taking the liability here because you want to save a couple hundred bucks, you know, once a quarter. Does that answer the question? I believe it does. Uh, John Aaron answered it. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, and the person replied, yes, thanks. Any other questions? We did that good of a job, no more questions? Um, I was like, I don't wanna hear that guy talk <laughs> I promise Lily can answer the questions. <laughs> He's there. Um, apparently not. Uh, I think what if you could give me the slides, um, a copy of the slides. Some people have asked for copies of that, and I can get them out to them. If you just email me those. Um, um, if, it is a ginormous presentation with the videos and stuff in it. Could you yeah, make really. it a could you make it a PDF and send it to me? Maybe. Could you. Well, we could talk offline about that. Maybe there's a way. We'll talk offline about that. Yeah. There's a lot of work I put in. Okay. Yeah, I got, I got you there. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can work out, and we'll, we'll do our best to get to everybody. Well, there are more, no more questions. I want to thank you gentlemen again for a great presentation, a lot of good information there. And this is being recorded, so we'll get it submitted as soon as we can for people who weren't able to make this session. And uh, I'm sorry, we do have a question that just came in. Um, what about hoods above residential cooking stoves in nursing home activity rooms? We do have, there's, uh, are they, first off, are they required? Yes. Is that a type one or a type two? Right? Because the, the age, they say type one because they're cooking for the public. It's not in the home, even though it's in its commercial building. So now they're still cooking for the public. But that's a little different looking system suppression system, right right they got they got several systems that actually use for residential cooking um so the question was are they required or if manufacturers parts of them okay what about hoods above residential cooking stoves and nursing home and activity rooms right did we answer that question? I mean, they're, they're, they are required. They are required. Because, are they everywhere? Yeah. I mean, do people typically put them? We do. Okay. Yeah, I know we do. Uh, I, do, the the ASJ, do the nursing homes do it? ASJ. Yeah. They can fall back on the ASJ. Right. That's what's going to fall back on the requirement. Okay. Well, there's another question that came up too. Yes. If uh, manufacturers' parts are not allowed to be interchanged in the system, how do we know if it's has occurred on an upgrade or a tenant finish. Um, so it's UL listed as a system, so the manufacturer's parts need to be there. Mm -hmm. How do you know if they didn't take an Amorex nozzle and put it on an Amorex system, or on, a, on an Ansel system, or a range guard this on a... Knowledge. 
this is in the book. I mean, I can I can tell you. If you're the authorities to have jurisdiction, they're not, not gonna. They're not gonna. I look. can't look up there and see it's there, right? Right. The only thing you can do is go to the website and make sure they're ANSOR certified or distributor or MRX. But them just looking at it, they will not know unless they know exactly what they're looking at. I mean, a lot of it is there is a huge difference it's in that because it's pre engineering, it's, it's designed to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a uh, Ansel links are color coded, right? Mm -hmm. But that's just the, this type, mm -hmm. then the little loopy ones are not, right? No, we're not. How do you tell if an Amorex system is all Amorex? The Amorex have copper looking links. Do they say Amorex on it? Mm -hmm. So if they're if yes. they're hanging on the pull station sure. over there, can you look at it and you say at least? Right. Amorex look copper and they hang in the, the links on the remote pool. You go to the link, it'll say Amorex on. The answers are color color. They got red, black, green, uh, and blue on their links. Um, would the components listed be provided on a work order? No. We request. No. So if the inspection work order is not, I mean, if we see one manufacturer's nozzles on another system, we're going to write it up, right? Right. We will see it. We will write it up. But the inspection report is not going to say this ANSEL nozzle part number or Amrix. I've never seen it. But any company out there, the ones that we deal with, the ones that we go to bat against every day and all that stuff, I mean, typically, yeah, they'll do it. They'll do it. We, and there's, out there. we and there's a couple out there that, I think most HJs are very well aware of uh, that will, you know, do some strange things. I mean, yes, have I seen two different system bottles mm -hmm. on the same system? Yeah. Yeah. You know, is it going to work? I don't know. Yeah. Integrity. I mean, it'll be on the end of the day. I mean, and it's, I know it. It's very true. And the thing is, is the thing that probably keeps us. Uh, up awake at night more than anything is the number of fires that you have in restaurants. Um, we report things every month, you know, with our newsletter and turn on newsletter and thing. And there's a fire about every. We put out a, one or two fires every month, whether it be on in a kitchen or uh, off road vehicle. Paint boo. Paint moose. <clears throat> I mean, they happen all the time. As you know, I mean, look, consider my audience. You all know that. Say so. Well, um, apparently that's the end of the question. So, again, I'll thank you. And, uh, again, we'll get this uh, recording up. If some mem members of your staff didn't get to see it today, we'll definitely have that out in the next few days. We'll send an email out to the same email that we sent this, this invite to. Tell them we can always email when you call us. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There's our email addresses. Okay. Or you can look us up, get a phone number in there as well. We have people, we have HJs and fire marshals calling us all the time. What's up? All the time. More than happy to answer any question that you have. It's it's our industry. We owe it to the industry to say, you know, hey, yeah. um, we do in-person training, we do all kinds of stuff. It's like it's all good. Yeah. I'm we here to help you. So anything, any questions, just give us a call, email us. I'll get back right back to you. All right, put those email addresses in the chat as well. So people can grab those if you need them. All right, gentlemen, I'll thank you again. And uh, everybody have a good day. Thanks, John. All right, thank you.